we need 100 percent more musical instruments sitting on the table in future pod- we do. podcasts we do. i think that's i think this is the first of many that's I'm the sure. takeaway from this all right joey welcome to the podcast hey very glad to be here we're doing it i just need to say this you have a podcaster's voice you really do oh thank you that records really well i have a tinny voice you gotta turn the bass up for me oh i can fix that for you what are we gonna talk about today we did our little exercise and we kind of talked about the great resignation Mm -hmm. uh, or the great reset resignation was it resignation slash reset was it that great let's start with that (laughs) numerically great all right the the underwhelming (laughs) resignation let's go the not so great well i guess the pandemic kind of kicked off the change in this yes because like for me this changed this changed my opinion because i started looking around for work that could be done remotely 100 percent of the time i wasn't really serious about 100 percent remote until this happened okay i'm starting the podcast with a segue i don't know if this is a great if this is a indicator of things to come or why stop now yeah <laughs> I, don't, I don't know but uh, since i work in product i kind of have this idea that there's a few good reasons to get everyone together i think like just when you're doing real real deep planning trying to get stuff going right you already have your strategy you already kind of figured out what's what you need to do now you want to do planning right like i think like sprint planning stuff like that Mm. if you need to meet with people face face for whatever reasons or if you want to do team celebration stuff like i think those right off the top of my head those are things that i would want to if i if i had budget to spend on things i would spend money on those to get everyone face face for those things i would agree and where i work that is exactly what is happening so i work at auth zero and that is that's a company that's been remote from the get-go one co-founder was based in bellevue outside Mm -hmm. seattle bellevue washington and the other co-founders based in buenos aires argentina so thousands of miles between the two of them pretty sweet Fly me several down. yeah several time zones yes i want to get flown to the <laughs> buenos aires office i want to have some steak down there and also get to meet my uh, south american co-workers because yeah. i work with a global team of developer advocates and uh, about a month ago now it uh, was the first time i met any of my co-workers face to face in a small summit and we're having a larger team summit in london next week actually so yeah, cool. looking forward to that but i have largely worked with them on the other side of a screen still zoom but you know that while the fate while having face-to-face communications over a screen is nice there's still something about actually being in the right. same room together right. that is why when jokes fall apart the comedian goes uh you had to be there yeah there yeah, is yeah. <laughs> there is an essence that being there yeah, yeah i think when, whenever whenever you need to take advantage of the the group, the power of the group, right? And, and when you need to ideate, you know, sprint planning is an example of that, I suppose, mm-hmm. right? That then face-to-face is tremendously useful. The, and you mentioned the team celebrations, I would say even team bonding, right? It's best done face-to-face or in person because you get to know the other colleague, team member as a person, right? Not just yeah. a professional who's sitting in a, a zoom box yeah. right you, i can't tell they, you they're a human being you get to learn about them yeah. you know what they do outside of work i mean the whole person that that's important yeah and uh, yeah we did that sort of thing we had a team bo- when we were at pycon in salt lake city a small portion of my team met for that and our team bonding experience was actually learning how to paint we had to paint a happy little Bob Ross mountain scene together. We did it at, <laughs> but we did it at a beer bar. There was a professional painting instructor there who walked us through the Bob Ross like process. Nice. And yeah, there were, uh, one of the nice things was, yeah, we saw each other outside of both literal on screen boxes and the metaphorical boxes of, oh, yeah, so and so specializes in programming language yeah. X and platform yeah. Y, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Very useful. Yeah, see that we talked on a previous podcast about this, and I wish I could remember where the research comes from because I, I got this from the Robert Cialdini influence mm. book. I got this is where I got this from. So <laughs> I guess that's where I got the research from. Yeah. Um, but uh, he was like, when you do, when you do team bonding type exercises, basically exercises that are not they're not work. You get the whole group together and you do something to promote like positive vibes between the team. You then have a short period of time to use those positive vibes mm-hmm. where the team can talk about difficult issues or can basically climb mountains that otherwise went while doing the normal day-to-day 
and taking that. I just got off a call five minutes ago and I'm jumping onto another call or whatever. Uh, you may not have that kind of synergy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Doesn't he also say that that equity only lasts so long it and then you right. have to it only rebuild so it, right. right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you do. Uh, it's yeah yeah there's a certain there's a certain vibe and you have to leap on that vibe while you're there which is why it is a terrible mistake to have the team bonding exercise at the end right of right. the get together session right. it's best to do it yeah do it as close to the beginning as you can yeah oh man i want to go down the road of uh i want to go down the road of a segue but i also want to keep us on track who can you think of in in your career who's done stuff like that like like tactically who has done stuff like that like i could easily assign this off to the scrum master or agile coach or somebody and be like here you go figure it out not every company has agile coaches and scrum masters so i'm like well who does it in other organizations that don't have those people chief cat herder yeah well, <laughs> basically yeah i mean in the end it, it i mean and oftentimes the scrum master is the cat herder yeah, right. but other times other times it's the person who in the contacts in their contacts application right also scribbles down little notes about each person just beyond na- right. name phone number email etc works in this department spouse's name is this mm-hmm. likes this it is that person the yeah. the connector the facilitator who does that sort of thing that- somebody if you are fortunate, there is somebody in your organization. Maybe they don't have the Scrum Master title, yeah. but they definitely fill that spiritual role. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and some organizations have HR do this almost almost like checking a box. I call that force fun because nobody really is bought into it. Yes. I have to go on this outing, right? Yeah. And sometimes it's the end result might be worthwhile. For example, they'll say, we're going to volunteer for half a day at X charity. That's a good thing to do, mm-hmm. but yeah, it's optional. So people don't necessarily feel like they need to go. Yeah. I, I think the focus is on the wrong thing in that case. It should be spun a different way. Yeah. It's like, let's get to know one another. While we're doing yeah. that, we can also do some good for the community. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? it, it cannot be an activity for activity's sake. Yes. I mean, at that point, if you're just looking for activity for activity's sake, just just go, you know what? The boardroom needs painting. Everybody, everybody grab a brush. <laughs> just go to the beach. Okay. <laughs> I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that either. <laughs> <laughs> I've come to this realization in the last couple of years of like, there's just people that have that in their personality. And then there's people that do not have it in there. But like, I, I, I think of a few different people that I've worked with. But I think one was, I don't remember what her title was, administrative assistant or something like that. One was like a communicate, corporate communications or something like that. It was mm-hmm. like a very different. You know, some people were agile coaches, you know what I mean? Probably a lot of them more than others. And they just have that skill. They have that desire to do that. And that they, they get enjoyment out of doing that. And then other people, you just can't, you, they can't fake it. When they try to do stuff like that, no. uh, yeah, they can't fake it. That's yeah. where you were saying. They, That's yeah. exactly where I was going. You yeah. will have fun, or you will get whipped. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or, right. or, or I, I, there's there's a Star Trek where one of the characters goes, "Fun will now commence." <laughs> <laughs> it's the kind of thing that makes me want to say, "Oh, next Thursday, I think I have a flu coming on." <laughs> <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Yeah, so I talked about a little bit about like what the effect of the great resignation was on me because it kind of changed my view of what I was looking for. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm also it's like I'm at a weird stage in my life too, where uh, I want to spend more time. Like my kids are still small, mm-hmm. like I want to spend more time with them. So I, I like I don't necessarily care about making a big name or whatever particular achievement or whatever that I might have cared about ten years ago. You know, in life I have prioritized different things. So that's like, I, while I'm looking around for another job, I have that in the back of my mind as well. It's like, well, I want another job, but I don't want to go back to where I was in my, when I was 30, for example, when I'm trying to become a manager, when I get in the office at eight and right. then I don't leave until 7 p.m. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. I know every product, I know every backend system, ins and outs, every single table in the database. You know what I mean? I know exactly where everything is, mm-hmm. but I only know that because I'm burning the candle at both ends. You know yeah. what I mean? Completely not sustainable. Yeah. Like I don't, I'm not interested in that. No. And you know, maybe there's a time in, the, in your life when you can do that, but it's not terribly long. And I have met people who have done that yeah. and 
they're not the happiest people. That's the problem. They're su- yeah. uh, they are successful by many many standards of measure. Yeah. But are they happy? And I can't honestly say that they are. No. And that that stuff, that stuff comes with a. There, there will be an ending. There will mm-hmm. be a a very significant cut ending to that for everyone whose career is like that. And it won't be. It'll be a a jarring. It'll be a cliff of an end. It won't yes. be a graceful tapering off. Oh no! In fact, usually <laughs> it's it, you. Usually, what happens? What happens? Actually, this is the thing that generates midlife crises. It is this exact kind of thing, and they lose their minds and. There's the divorce, and then there is the Camaro with the Hemi. And <laughs> yeah, and sometimes there's health issues that result mm. as a result of this. They're yeah, not right. just physical, mental right. health. Me- too, yeah, right? me- uh, yeah, mental health issues. And you know what? That's a really big concern these days. Yeah. More so than before, we're, we're actually taking it seriously. It's, it, it's no longer... It's no longer suck it up, buttercup. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah we, we actually kind of understand, yeah, you know what? It's... It's just it's another part of it's another part of health. We don't treat it as differently. We we actually have more sympathy for it, just like we have sympathy for someone with a broken arm. Why not? You know, why not someone with a mental health issue? It mm-hmm. it does affect their life uh, in the same ways. Yeah, yeah. I'm kind of surprised by the amount of people that have no empathy, especially in corporate America. Like that's 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 the this item that's the great resignation that's where mm-hmm. i'm pivoting back to this okay because the hardcore business person on this topic will say well yeah if you just squeeze all your employees and treat them badly then over time you you'll lose all the best people and your business will kind of go to crap and uh, your business will tank and they'll move to better places and better and better businesses will take over your business and whatever and that's just the the natural cycle mm-hmm. that, there's nothing to do about that you don't need to i was like really like that's it has to be that way? Like, Well, so the Jack Welshers of the world will disagree with that, and they'll just say, let's breed all A-type people. We'll reward them. They're yeah, the ones that get the pay raises. The B-type, we're going to whip them a little because they need to get up there to the yeah, A-tier, yeah. and the C-type will fire them. Yeah, the bottom, and the, yeah. what will happen is our companies will, yeah. will become so strong that nobody's going to be able to buy us out. That's what he would have said. Mm-hmm. He did say, actually. Uh, also, also, <laughs> like to put a little star next to it, because I've read a lot of Jack Welsh, so also a little star next to Jack. Jack Welsh said a lot of stuff. Uh, <laughs> like, he, he certainly was a fan of say the most things, and and if you literally say everything, mm-hmm. you'll be right all the time. That's yeah. true. Because you'll have said all the right things, so oh, you'll yeah. be like, look, I said all the right yeah. things. Like, consistently every year, just looking at, at, at your arbitrary performance re- yearly performance reviews and cutting the bottom 10 percent because they're just they just happen to score less that's i don't know if that's a great strategy like i, I agree with you that I, was his strategy like yeah that was definitely i don't know strategy. if that's a good strategy no i don't think it is i don't know if that protects you again because there was a thing in my original show notes <laughs> surprise we didn't use <laughs> we're on our own we're on agenda number three that's there, all right we're there, being agile there was a thing in my original show notes about uh, a sign of bad management and you won't know this when you come into the organization for the first time a sign of bad i, I ask this on product manager interviews all the time i'm like hey tell me about the last three projects projects mm-hmm. i don't like the word projects but i use it in this instance on mm-hmm. purpose Tell me about the last three projects. You could say initiatives if they truly are. If you're really talking to a product-led company, you could say initiatives. Tell me about the last three really big initiatives that your company has taken on and where the idea came from. And because I'm trying to figure out if they're a company where the smartest ideas come from the, the directors and VPs and executives who are like, just do this. This is a great idea. I came up with it when I was in the shower. So it must be right. So it, I know it's a great idea. Yeah. Don't question it. Like we don't empiricism. We don't need that. Experiments. I don't know what that is. Leave it alone. Like I know what the best idea is because I'm trying to vet out. Because usually people with that attitude, if they're in a, a, a management level positions in the organization, if they have that attitude, there is a high likelihood that they will hire other people 
to be line managers under them that mm-hmm. also share that attitude. So if you can identify that, like, <laughs> oh, no, 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 I just, like, I'm mm-hmm. Bob the developer, and uh, I just do what I'm told from yeah. Jim the manager, and he gets his marching orders from above. So I don't know, somebody in leadership gives me the, tells me what to do, and then I don't really ask. Yeah. Yeah. Run, don't I just, walk. I just work on what they tell me to work on. Yeah. The great resignation, I would hope, is an initiative that also includes like not working under that type of management anymore. Yeah. And the tricky thing is detecting that while you are looking for right. your next great job. Part of the problem is, yeah, how do you tell? How do you figure out that the manager is a Rick looking for another Morty to add to his Morty army? And that is the thing. And in fact, that's actually a problem that's kind of circulating through geek culture at the moment is there's there's a lot of worship of Rick Sanchez from Rick yeah. and Morty, despite the fact that you're not really supposed... Right. He's a fascinating character, but you're not supposed to like him, and you're definitely not supposed to emulate him. Right. Yes, he's brilliant, but yes, he's terrible as well. Right. Yeah, that's a good question. Though. How do you find out, right? I mean, I guess you could look at... The best you could do, I suppose, is to either contact people that have just left, see if they're willing to speak about it, mm-hmm. Uh, read Glassdoor reviews for what they're worth right, or similar. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know how else you find you, out about you, that. I think about when I was a manager. When I was a manager, I would always have, they would talk to the initial screening recruiter first because that's just the company just does that. They just want to, the recruiter wants to just move through people real fast. And also the initial recruiter could be outside organizations as well. So whatever. You, they go through the initial screen first. Usually it's on the phone. Again, this is before the pandemic. And then the next interview they would have would be through me. Mm-hmm. And I would talk to them, and if I and, and usually I would vet them. I would do. I, I usually tell people, at least my employees anyway. I'm like the, the first ten minutes in the interview, I can tell if I'm really getting along. Like if I have a vibe with somebody, sure. And then the rest of it is like t- like technical analysis, deep dive questions mm-hmm. that kind. Because of, I'm hiring people that could potentially their their career path. I, I was hiring people into a QA department at that point, so I need someone with an analytical mind. Right. I also have in mind the culture of the people that work in my organization. So in the back of my mind, while I'm also vetting their analytical skills, I'm also thinking to myself, can I put this person in a room with Joey and Ohm and have their voice heard in the conversation? I'm thinking about that while I'm in the interview as well, right? Like if you are the developer and he's like the development manager and the test person has to lobby to be like, hey, do we think about this? Do we think about this? How are we gonna test this? You know, to be engage the business on whatever. So I have a few things in the back of my mind that I'm kind of talking about. But then, if they clear the first two interviews, mm-hmm. I want them to talk to my team members. And okay. even even though they might go on to a product team that's completely separate from my team members, from my other team, they might never work directly side by side with my other team members because all at that company, the the QA team were all distributed on different teams. And usually it was never more than one QA person on a team. Okay. But I wanted to make sure that my team members felt like this was the right person to hire. And that, that kind of was the, the way that I went through it. But in my interviewing experience, when I've been interviewing for jobs, I almost have never met the team. Like as yeah. a standard part of the normal interview process. Oh, Okay. Occasionally that happens. Occasionally they'll say, well, I will have you speak with so-and-so. So you can ask them questions yeah. and flip side of that too, they can they can figure out yeah, yeah, if yeah. you're gonna be a fit for them, both on a technical level in, in, in technical jobs, yeah. but also on a cultural level. Are you a mm-hmm. good fit for their organization? Right. They're trying to figure that out. Yeah, well, I did in my interviewing process with Auth0. In mm-hmm. fact, I, work, I met them on two different levels. One was, first of all, the standard, the standard interview. Yeah. Basically, it was I talked to two, the two team members who I would be very likely to work with the most. So this is the developer advocate content team, and yeah, basically side by side, yeah, side by side interview on the Zoom screen. Yeah. And I used a Chris Voss FBI invest, interrogator trick, which was watch watch the reactions of the face of the person who isn't, isn't talking speaking, yes that gives you the true sign of yeah, how the yeah, interview yeah. is going the other one of course was the technical exercise which in my case of course i have to talk to developers and say hey this is how you use our stuff is i had to write an article with code basically saying all right here they basically said your assignment and this is the actual assignment the, your assignment is to write an article showing how to secure an api with auth0 written in Kotlin and Spring Boot. 
Okay, so proper challenge. They knew I was a mobile developer, so I had Kotlin right. And the first thing I had to do was Google Spring Boot and go, what what, wait, what is this? Because yeah. I have a, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'm mobile and Spring Boot's a backend technology, but I'm going, okay, I can figure this yeah, out. Yeah. And in- you, You're a .NET developer though. Uh, well, I used to be, yeah, I used to be yeah. Microsoft. So oh, yes, used to, .NET. Yeah, whatever. Like, yeah. .NET, yeah, .NET. <laughs> I was on the Windows Phone team. I tried really hard to make Windows Phone happen. It was, uh, it was a, Beautifully futile attempt, but I, I enjoyed uh, my experience. Listen, that, like, I don't know if 100% of that was on the team. Well, didn't, didn't they use a bunch of that? Sorry, like segue. Cause sure. <laughs> didn't they use a bunch of that in the in the development for uh, tablets and touchscreens later? Yeah, yeah. So the user interface that is on the surface is Albert Shum's uh, Metro design. Yeah, It's right, based yeah. on Af Albert Shum's right. Metro design for right. Windows Phone 7. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was. I don't think that was a design problem. Like no. I know this is not the podcast. That it's no, it, it, it was a whole bunch. It was a whole bunch of things. But you know what? It is a good example of where several teams with very good intentions somehow and a lot of money. Yeah, a half billion yeah, yeah. uh, and a half billion dollar marketing budget supposedly right. could bomb. Yeah. It, yeah, it happens. I learned. I learned a lot oh, from man. I like uh, the only reason that I say this because I remember that I had a couple of developers that I work with that had Windows phones. Like they mm -hmm. were on the cutting edge. They and uh, man, they loved and and half the half the development team was iOS mm -hmm. and half the development team was Windows phones. And there was like one person that had an Android in the office at that point. I remember who uh. it was. But like and no, everyone hated Android on the development team. I don't know why. I don't remember. But uh, the Windows phone guys, they, they loved their Windows phone. I I owned a couple of Windows phones yeah i like them occasionally i would get frustrated because they will just lock up oh, yeah. but yeah well on the whole it was pretty good i like the metro design yeah now the reason they hated android was because it was probably one of the early iterations c or donut i because remember they yeah they, they were naming them after right. desserts yeah, yeah, for a while yeah. right uh, and uh, android of that era was terrible right yeah. it was absolutely it was. terrible because basically they were still they were still coming from the approach of mobile the mobile platform is like the desktop platform, but lamer. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but lame. No, because that was also the, that was also the Microsoft attitude, and that's to be, and that's fair because what was their the company motto at the time was a computer on every desktop and in every home. It yeah. was the desktop operating system right. that was the goose that laid the golden egg, and everything else was just. The desktop system, but lamer. That was their approach to the web as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I went to Microsoft during the peer-to-peer -peer era. Yeah. And I remember being told IE6 would be the last browser because the future is applets, mm. .NET applets, just mm -hmm. like Java. And the Java people were saying, yeah, don't worry. Yeah, the hot Java browser yeah, yeah, is, yeah. yeah, don't worry about it. It's a placeholder. The future is applets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> That was my, my early QA engineering experience was all in Java, like yeah. pure Java. And it was a Java and Selenium was just mm -hmm. a beast to work with. But, but I mean, like you still like it's still modern when you're doing mobile automation and you send out your code to run in like there's like farms where you can send mm -hmm. out where they'll run your code in 50 different devices or yeah. how, you know, however many, like if you're trying to do like a scale sure. test or whatever, or if you support a ridiculous number of phones like we did at the time. Mm -hmm. What a pain to get all that stuff working. But again, like now, now I don't, <laughs> I don't even, I think I took it off my resume because I don't even, I never, I don't even code in Java anymore because I, because I do everything in Python now. I'm like, okay. well, it's like, oh, yeah. it's like, oh, I can write uh, 87 lines in Java or I can write four lines, lines in Python like, yeah. and get what I need done. Or one line in Perl. You know, no, just kidding. Plus, plus, <laughs> plus now you'll never be able to edit it again. That's yeah, true. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Somebody and always has to throw it like Perl, just throw, throw some throw. dice and just see what comes up. See who rages first. <laughs> well, well, yeah. And actually, that brings me to one of the things is that talking about the Great Resignation, one of the problems about planning for it is it's really it's really hard to predict things. I am terrible at predicting yeah. things. During the dot-com bubble, I worked at Corey, sci-fi writer Corey Doctorow's startup. Mm -hmm. And we saw a demo that this Japanese company contacted us. And they said, we want to show you a demo of this thing on iMode, which was... The, which was basically a programmable mobile platform that was only on Japanese cell phones back when they yeah. were the super world leaders. We had yeah, embarrassing yeah. cell phones. They had the cool ones. Yeah. And this thing was, this application on iMode was 
something where you could type a shortish message, SMS length, mm -hmm. that would be broadcast to all your friends, telling them how you're feeling or what you're thinking at the moment. And I remember telling Corey, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. And what's that? That's Twitter, that's, that's Facebook, everything. that's right. everything. Yeah, you're right. yeah, you're so right. I try not to... Yeah. I, I try not to predict this stuff anymore. I'll tell you, I was the same way because I, I lived in Japan in the 1998, 1999, and yeah. moved out of Japan in 2000. And uh, like their cell phones were just light years. Yeah. I had, I, like Even when I moved back to the U.S. in 2000, or when I moved back to Florida, not the U.S., when I moved back to Florida in 2004. Four, Florida's in the U.S.? Three, four. Yeah, Florida's in the U.S. Sticks out of the ocean. Yeah, special, man. Man. yeah, yeah uh, we're, we're our own specials. It's that little so. sandbar. <laughs> like, I had my little... Uh, what the no what was the Nokia phone everyone had back in the 33... 360? 30, 33? The I candy bar? Or? The, 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 it was like the little hockey puck yeah, looking yeah. little... Anyway, yeah, a little candy uh, bar like format. A, uh, you play Snake on it. That was yeah. about the extent... Yeah. Uh, like even With the though D9 it typing? was like, yeah, it yeah. was like you might as well have been using an '80s brick oh, yeah. phone compared to what they yeah, had in Japan. Are, yeah, yeah. It was way way ahead. Yeah. So like we were talking, you were talking about doing a demo and having to work with back end technologies, and then we segued to yeah. all this. But one of the nice things about that is, and I think they did it on purpose, was that it required me to communicate with them. So I oh, just I go see. back, hey, well, what do you think about this? And then they suggested, you know what, just use an in memory. Uh, yeah, use an in-memory database. I suggest you use this one. And I said, okay, I'll just roll. Uh, I'll roll it into the project. And we had a great, we had a great back and forth. Yeah. And I think that not only gave them mm. a good feeling about working with me, especially since they don't get to see, they couldn't see me in person. This was September 2020 when yeah. I was interviewing. And at the same time, it also gave me a good feeling for what it would be like to work with them. And I think that that's one thing that we're going to have to factor in with the great resignation or do we have to return to the office? Can we, can we do hybrid? Can we do full time apart? And I think it's also time to kind of review Conway's law again, yeah. which is the products that you create mimic the communication methods right. of the product maker. This is all brand new territory, and maybe we got to get some lessons from the bubonic plague because the bubonic plague changed a whole bunch of things in Europe, and it happened at about the same time as the printing press, the big technological revolution of the time, mm -hmm. and a whole bunch of changes came out over, popped up from that, including the university system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Where all of a sudden, at least each university could get one book, and that's where we developed the system of teaching that we still have to this day. Somebody is in the front of the class with the book, reading it out, and everybody else is listening. Thank Gutenberg for that, I guess. This is the yeah, but it was, yeah, I mean, yeah, it was I, I mean, just to spark off the revolution, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Created an information revolution. It was the Marshall McLuhan would go, hey, that's, that's the first time we had cool media. Everything was hot before. I have to mention, I'm from Toronto, so I have to wave the McLuhan flag every now and again. I'm, requ I'm required. That, that way I get to keep my Canadian citizenship. So. Nice, nice. <laughs> Yeah, we, we uh, that's way down on the priority list. It's, it's way down in the backlog to get a school teacher on because I think the like the roots of the modern school system and the, and the specifically the methods of the modern school system, like they're tied up in the birth of manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm real interested to talk about with somebody who understands because there are being there are experiments going on now in schooling with not not distributed but more like a where the teacher introduces something and then the, and then the students kind of come to the learnings in group, that kind of learning. Yeah. I don't know what the, I don't know what's called. I, I know exactly what you mean though, because I think, forget about schooling, but at, at the higher level, professional level, if you're studying law or medicine, that is exactly the model because there's so much to learn and most of the time lectures, etc., are completely optional. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a concept is introduced and then you work in teams and you go and research yourself, work with your group, your right. teams. And that's how, that's where most of the learning happens, to be honest. Yeah. I, I can say that because I, I'm going through this now. My daughter's been in med school three years now. All right. And that's, you know, she'll ping me in the middle of the day and, you know, we, we chat. And I'm like, don't, don't you have to be in class? She said, don't, Dad, you're so old school. No, I don't go to class. I'm like, wait. You don't go to class? I'm thinking, well, what am I paying what for? Pay? I was right? about to say. <laughs> like, no, no, lectures are optional. Uh, they're mm. recorded. We just watch the videos at two times the speed. And, mm. and we do that in a group setting. And that's where all the learning happens. I'm like, cool. Yeah. So a lot of people have a hard time with that model, though, right? Yeah. Because they'll say, well, what, what are they really learning? If, they, if you leave them to their own devices? 
But I think that's where a lot of the idea germination happens. They learn something, they share back, and everybody then challenges one another in the group. Yeah. That's a lot more powerful than the method we just talked about where somebody at the front of the room, usually a professor, basically just says something and everybody believes that. Some people make notes, some are yeah. texting people, whatever. Yeah, there's a software example, actually. There was, uh, there was a classroom where they had different grades of students, grades like third grade through fifth grade, learning programming with Logo, the little language mm -hmm. where you move the turtle around yeah. and draw pictures. And they decided that the second graders would only be taught how to move the turtle back and forth. And the third and fourth graders would learn how to turn the turtle, huh. how to turn the turtle <laughs> to draw more than just the line. They'd learn how to draw squares or different different polygons. But the grade two kids started going, oh, wait a minute. I think I figured out the secret to turning the turtle. It has to do with numbers. And yeah. they started collaborating together and they figured out how to, they figured out the rotate yeah. command and they learned about angles and they learned about degrees without a teacher having to go, okay, everybody sit down. We're going to learn about angles yeah. and we're going to learn about degree. Yeah, they figured awesome. it out. And like, you know what? That will stick with them. Of course. I think more than the subject, it's, it's the concept of learning that way and the thirst to kind of, to discover knowledge that way going forward in the rest of their lives. I mean, that I think is pivotal, right? This is a way you learn. You don't learn by just listening to somebody. You learn by doing and working with other people. I wrote a book down to reference what we were talking about, but the, but we're past that. Well, <laughs> so well we can, we can not, still go back. No, 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 it wasn't. It was a, a time to think by Nancy Klein. It wasn't like I I I got through the book really quick, but the her her idea was like you have to protect. You know, like, I don't know a way to say it. Like quiet time. You have to protect time to kind of be by yourself and think about mm -hmm. a situation rather than always like somebody interrupting you every two seconds and asking you like, hey, come on. Like I think about a meeting where you're trying to brainstorm ideas. I, mean, I think about uh, a retrospective is actually what I think about for this. Mm -hmm. In a retrospective where you're like, okay, uh, everyone, I'm gonna give you five minutes, put your ideas on the board. Uh, what you know what I mean to, what we can improve or whatever whatever whatever, whatever method you're using I'd say well why like instead of five minutes how about I give you 20 minutes mm -hmm. we're going to assume that the time box of the retro is a reasonable time box okay. and, uh, instead of our normal ridiculous like <laughs> we're going to get done in 20 minutes <laughs> yeah so we have a good long time there's like the, maybe there's lunch involved it's you know what I mean the team building type of thing preceded that and then we go to but the writing up of things that we want to talk about like we're, we're not going to put them on the board yet just write them down in your own little space mm -hmm. and it's just you and yourself like thinking quietly and writing what you think we should be improving and then at the end of the time we'll throw those items on the board yeah. and we'll and we'll talk about it but but the actual idea creation is done individually like a lot of times on the podcast we talk about doing idea creation and we talk about sprint planning stuff like that okay. like how you're going to plan and do the work sure. we talk about that stuff in the context of well you should be collaborating and talking through how to build things with other developers the, this book kind of challenges that to say a lot of creativity happens on your own yeah and especially the type of person like if you're a real hardcore introvert or whatever you need to be left alone to think about it to think about the idea and like to digest it for a while and, and really think about what you have to say on the topic and you know what even as an extrovert that is the case like on yeah so i work at places where eventually they do the personality or strengths test or yeah. something like that and uh you know you look at my chart and you go that's not that's a golden retriever that's not a person <laughs> that I, I register as that no and i'm an extrovert but i still need that quiet time yeah not to recharge but just to work uh, just to work out the fine points of an idea and figure it out and harness the subconscious and things like that. And yeah, I'm a firm believer in, I, I like the idea of have, having more time during a retrospective to work on that idea. And in fact, I think it should be called an introspective inside the retrospective. Right. Yeah. Right. Where you do that. Yeah. An introspective in the retrospective. Yeah, I, I see Ohm percolating, so I got to cut in front of him right quick. Like, but her point in the book was like, you if you're a facilitator, I don't think she specifically called this out, but mm -hmm. uh, if you're facilitating an event like that, you need to protect that quiet time. I think of this from the again, I go back to the 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 QA perspective where I'm trying to figure out how to replicate a bug. For example, mm -hmm. I can't tell you how long it's going to take. 
to try to replicate a bug. But I can tell you, like, I, I'm, I will put my effort inside of a time box. Mm -hmm. If I'm messing around and clicking around or whatever, and I go for more than, I don't know, 45 minutes, I, I'm going to ask for help. I'm going to sure. call the developer over. Hey, maybe we can... I'll tell you the stuff I tried. Maybe we can step through the code and figure it out. F figure it out for another way. And and neither one of us has to s sleep with our head in mud. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the point is, like, if I was facilitating something like that, I would have to protect that quiet time. I was gonna say that I like uh, techniques like uh, one to for all uh, from Liberty Structures, where you give people a time box to write down things themselves by by themselves yeah. and then they get back together and you split them up in pairs mm -hmm. and they explore what they each wrote and you do it again with fours and then everybody gets together and the groups of four share what they've discussed yeah i, I like that because you, you actually get quite quite productive with that so there's other there's other liberating structures this is one of my favorite yeah. though how big does that scale can you do that with like uh, larger it, groups? It, it can it can scale quite large. It can. Huh. Now the the thing about that though is people use it the way they want to, right? <laughs> so there 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 is no guidance. I mean, it's the only guidance is use time boxes, right. right? But go back to what we were saying about giving people enough time. So when I ask people to write things down by themselves, that's the biggest time box. And then the next one is a little shorter. Yeah. Because uh, now you're going into the next one with mm. two discrete ideas. Yeah. Right? That you're debating between the two. And then same thing between the four. Yeah. But the initial set, we don't want to limit that. So that's why I give the longest time there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it'll scale pretty big. Hmm. Yeah, you know what? I may have to experiment with that on a very challenging environment. I am coaching on startup bus this year. So I'm going to be in the Florida bus. Oh, yeah. And it is a very challenging environment to write software in. There is unreliable power, yeah. unreliable Wi-Fi. You're on a bus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but some but you know what? You are forced to you are forced to be clever and you are forced to be agile and actually I found it to be a very helpful exercise and experience as a participant and I I I'm I'm going to enjoy coaching. Man. Oh, how I wish we had uh, free Wi-Fi citywide like they have in some some cities in California and mm -hmm. Europe. It would really facilitate those kinds of things. Are they are they driving to Austin? Is that yep. what they're driving to? Yeah, we're going oh, we're we're going to Austin. Man. <laughs> how do you like oh man, I would like I would have to get one. You ever you seen one of those uh, monitors that attach to the side of your laptop? Like yeah. I, there's no way I can't like I try occasionally to code on one screen and I can't do it. I was like, I can't do it on one screen. Once you've once you've had multiple screens, it's so hard to go back to one. Oh it is. Yeah. I went to, I've been, I have been in Toronto for the past two weeks visiting family for the first time since mm -hmm. the plague and I was just working on my laptop screen and then I came home last night and just finished off a little work with three screens and I was going, Oh my god, this oh, yeah, is I know. this is so much better. How did how did we ever do this in the nineties when we had the <laughs> six forty by four eighty laptop screen? Oh man. A little compact three eight sixes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> my my ninety six megs of RAM. Yeah. And Visual Basic five. Oh man. <laughs> oh boy. I wanna take another like I wanna go into the segue. What was your first computer? Like what was your first computer? <laughs> Apple two E. I was I was like Whoa. I, Apple two E. Oh man. Why was a Spectrum ZX? Ah. Spectrum Z. I yeah, don't even know what that it, is. It was made really by, small. Yeah, made by Sinclair, mm -hmm. British company. Mm -hmm. Licensed it to Timex, uh, 4K <laughs> RAM, and in fact, all the basic programming language commands actually required you to hit. Uh, they were all attached to each, each key. key. You'd That's have right. to hit a shift oh, or yeah, yeah. Uh, some magic yeah, Vulcan yeah. nerve pinch combo <laughs> to get things like print and run and go to and go sub and all those classic That's basic exactly words. Right. Yes. yes. No, but it was no, it was a classic and it may this is where Gen X learned how to code. The other place I learned how to code was a store called Batteries Included in Toronto. They tolerated kids hanging around That's and, cool. in fact, answering customer questions in the end because they were going, this is free labor. This is awesome. Yeah, and yeah. I'm <laughs> happy to do it. And, that's, and they sold Commodore stuff. So I learned on the Vic, uh, I learned on the Vic 20 and the 64 as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Commodore 64, yeah. Yep. We've all evolved from those first machines to what we're using today, right? I'm just going to try to tie it back to personal agility trying, in some yeah. way. No, it's <laughs> like I, I don't. I don't think it, it's, it's not even a stretch. Like I don't even think it's a stretch to tie it back to personal agility. Because I told somebody very recently, because they asked me about my skill set. I was like, oh, I, I was like, I don't even know what question you're asking me right now. Because mm -hmm. basically, my whole skill set turns over 
every two or three years. Like I, I wasn't yeah. programming in Python three years ago. I mean, okay. Python was around certainly, but yeah. I, like, when I, uh, w- what I was doing was super quick scripting. So I was using, I was in a window shop, so I was using PowerShell. Sure. So everything I needed that was real quick scripting, I was using PowerShell for, and PowerShell can interact with APIs and PowerShell can interact with databases. I was like, PowerShell was everything I needed. But then when I started working at a company where I was interfacing with data scientists and data engineers Mm -hmm. who basically exclusively worked in Python and published Jupyter Notebooks, I was like, well, I, I don't, like, this is a great time to jump over and do all this scripting I can do in this language, in this other language, where quite honestly, it's less lines of code, so I like it even more. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's got a, a, a real tight community that is on top of every question you might have about the programming language. So for me, personal agility has to do with jumping from one thing to the next. I don't know, like a, this is, I'm not paying this in the greatest light when I'm about to say, going back to crossing, crossing the chasm, there are people that jump from one thing to the next like I can imagine the people that try to adopt Python when Python was like six months old. You know what I mean? Uh, it, yeah. it does a few things. Mm-hmm. You, like it doesn't have, it, it can't do like advanced mathematical operations. It can't map uh, plots to draw maps and stuff like that. There was a bunch of different things that it couldn't do. Sure. But they would use it anyway because it's like cutting edge. Yeah. Like, gotta have the latest thing. I may not be in that absolute right at the edge type mm-hmm. of thing. I might not, might, might not be at the cutting edge. But I like to think that I like to be in the very next category after that yeah. to where I'm always moving along to be like, well, this technology that we have now, like, for example, we were talking about before where I'm programming in Java. Right. I'm like, hey, Java's great. I don't like to have to take the afternoon off to process a file or interact with an API because I got to deal with a whole bunch of other stuff. Like, I like to do it in two lines <laughs> or three lines. Yeah. You'd hate it, Cobalt. No. Well, yeah. <laughs> but once upon a time, Java was quite amazing I because um, compared to having to build something in C++, especially, say, Visual C++ yeah. of that era, yeah, yeah. Java was mind-blowingly, was mind-blowingly amazing. Yeah. yeah. And that's the thing is that, once again, C++, of course, was a game changer as mm-hmm. well. And yeah, I had to switch. Yeah, to switch all the time because that that first job required me to program in a programming language that they never covered in school because it was manufactured by ma- Macromedia. Yeah. I came from C, and then all of a sudden I had to learn Lingo, mm-hmm. which is basically a mishmash of HyperTalk, the HyperCard programming language, yeah. with because the guy who developed it, John Henry Thompson. Came from came from MIT, I believe. Mm-hmm. There was a little bit of lisp in there as well. There were little lisp, there were little lispisms yeah, yeah. Uh, that that were there. And then all of a sudden, when I left Mackerel and started a consultancy with a friend of mine, we decided, oh, we're going to go. I think the best thing for us is Visual Basic. Yeah, and but yeah, bouncing from language to language should not be a surprise to anybody in software, especially since. This is an incredibly young industry. The yeah. mathematical definition of computable isn't even 100 years old yet. Mm-hmm. The COBOL spec is what, from 1959. That's not that long ago. There are right. many people who are alive. Then we have machi- a lot of banking machines still run on COBOL. That's correct. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, Lisp, so that's the I remember thing. Lisp. Lisp and Prolog. Those yes. are the two things that we used to use years yep. ago at a telecommunications company I worked at. I have no memory of this place. No. <laughs> I, I don't want the memory of that place. <laughs> no, but the, like the the point of this category for me is like uh, like anybody. Uh, it, it was weird that somebody asked me a question. Mm-hmm. Somebody asked me. Uh, I would always ask this in interviews as well. Is like t- tell me about what you've done to update your skills or stay current, or tell me what you've done to learn in the last eighteen months, for example. Okay, to update your skills. I would ask that in an interview question because it kind of separates uh, to people that are like me that that expect. That all the skills that you have, like three years from now, they might be completely different skills. Okay. Like, uh, for me, the skills that I've invested in in the last three years, they haven't necessarily been. I'm like I gave the example of Python. That's sure. in the last in the last three. So, yes, they have. But also, the skills that I've invested in the last three years have been a lot of facilitation skills, mm-hmm. st- connecting development teams to strategy because the, the yeah. individual developers don't necessarily ask, like, what is the benefit to the business if we're doing this? Now, they mm-hmm. should. 
be asked, they should be yes. asking more of the, that. This goes back to the great resignation. The individual developers, on, again, I can do this because I'm in product. I couldn't do this mm -hmm. when I'm a scrum master because everyone would be like, get out of here, kid. What? <laughs> why are you asking questions? Yeah. Like, we got this. I can do this in product because my team is going to ask me why it's important to do this directive, Mr. VP or whatever. Like, where does this get us as a company? Where are we going? Who are the customers? Like, let's talk about the, not, not the market segments. I did this recently. I challenged some people higher up in the company. I don't know if it was a good challenge. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I, I, I have yet to see what shakes out from this challenge. Yeah. I was like, what, what, what product are you trying to craft from this? They haven't thought all this through no. clearly. No, 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 no. They, they haven't, but they, but the, but the, the hypothesis was interesting to me. And that's why I dug into it and, and it, like I jumped on it in front of anyone else because I was like, this is this is the way that product innovation should be brought to development teams. It should be a, hey, mm -hmm. can we deal with this problem, right? right. The, I see a problem. Do, do you think there's a way we can deal with this problem? Okay, well, um, deal with this problem for who? And then we start narrowing on um, mm -hmm. that, that kind of thing. I, I know we're not we're not really on personal agility anymore, but uh, or, or prediction of the future. We're not on any of these yeah. topics anymore. We're on a segue. <laughs> That's a space we're safely uh, comfortable with, though. I, I don't even know why why I segued off to this. Probably because well, there's a certain element of personal agility there. I mean, look, if you, you kind of took that on as a this is an interesting challenge. Have you have you thought about which mm -hmm. market it is? Who's our yeah. ultimate consumer? Right, those kinds of th so your typical in line kind of person wouldn't do that they would take this as a directive and they go yeah. start working on it right yeah right and right. Off, off we go yeah and that's and actually that's one thing about personal agility as well is that you've got to realize what industry you're in and that we're at the point right now where computers are now and software are part is part of everything and we're at the point where you know what software software isn't a what it's a how it's yeah. how it gets done so yeah. when i worked at one particular company it was an rfid chip co company yeah. i actually say no you know what i was in the fashion industry i was we were making rfid chips to prevent counterfeiting of fashion goods and you have to you have to understand who's buying this stuff why do they need this yeah why do they need this particular solution yeah who are the ultimate end customers who's the customer that I'm directly developing it for. What do they need? What do the ultimate yeah. end customers need? And while I was using software to solve a problem, I was actually functioning within the fashion industry and had to learn the ins and outs of that particular yeah. industry. Then right. later on, when I was working and writing mobile apps for Lilypad, which is an alcohol industry mobile CRM, mm -hmm. I said, look, I'm in the alcohol industry. I just happen to write software that helps people sell alcohol. What a brilliant industry. What a great industry that. Oh, it's yeah. a fa it's a fantastic yeah, yeah, industry. Yeah. Unfortunately, it took a hit during the pandemic uh, yeah, and that's when I got laid off and that's where I started my own personal experience with the great layoff, if not yeah. the great resignation because yeah, I yeah. didn't yeah, I didn't leave, but yeah. and had to and had to and had to figure out how do I yeah, how do I find a job in this how do I find a job in this particular market yeah. uh, w with high uncertainty and what tricks can I pull from my bag? I think increasingly, just over the last maybe two, two years or two and a half years, people have had to get to grips with their own personal agility, not, not only because mm -hmm. they're a victim of the circumstances such as yourself, right? You, you got laid off. Yeah. But it's got nothing to do with that right you just got laid off and that that was enforced upon you but i know at least four people uh, very well that they they had good jobs stable jobs mm -hmm. and they just said this is not what we want to do yeah so all four in my example quit their jobs without having a job lined up yeah i found that fascinating because it's well a it's four which kind of surprised me yeah. like, and now because that didn't happen before mm -hmm. the pandemic now I'm thinking, why, what would what would compel somebody to say, I'm going to take a risk here, right? I have a risk because I still have bills to pay, but I, mm -hmm. I've just decided this is not what I want to do. I'll figure out what I want to yeah. do. And they just leave. Now, fast forward a little bit, mm -hmm. happy to report all four of them ended up in other situations yeah. where they've got gainful employment. One actually started their own I say companies sort of LLC. They're, they're consulting, but okay. but they're getting paid for their for their yeah. daily work, basically. Yeah. So, it, my point is, you're taking a risk here, 
right? Yeah. And that wasn't the case before. If it yeah. was enforced upon you, you got laid off, then you start scrambling, basically, as yeah, most yeah. people do. I got to dust up my resume now. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> a lot of people make the mistake of looking for work when they need to rather than when they have work. Well, right? That's, that's the so, typical advice is you, know, you look for work while you while still have a job. While you still yeah, have yeah. work. Yeah, yeah, it's the Tarzan yeah. rule. Tarzan, I've, make sure he's got a grip on the next vine before yeah, letting go of the last one. Yeah. I've known quite a few people that, like, I, uh, I don't think that I would have the confidence to do it to just be like well, you know what I don't like I tell people that all the time I'm like if I go through another buyout I would just quit like the same be like oh you oh, you selling the company that I'm part of cool well this is my last day like that <laughs> like morally speaking I say that that's what I, well assuming you're not getting it's, equity or anything yeah, like yeah, that yeah, is yeah. like of course. I just don't want to go through it like I've been through four like I don't want to go through it again yeah and but I've known quite a few people that have quit without jobs mostly when they quit without jobs is because either they're going through kind of what we talked about earlier where it's like this doesn't line up with where I want to be in life anymore Mm -hmm. or or they're in a position where they're being asked to do questionable morally ambiguous type of things there was a company I I worked at one time where Mm -hmm. they brought in a new executive that's the way I'll leave I'll leave it that way okay They, they brought in a new executive and the new executive his plan to bolster the company started with buying app reviews to get them a higher rating in the uh, stores so, yes. yeah you know where i'm going this yeah dude i he or she i don't even want to name their position where they were but uh, they resigned shortly after that because they're like i don't even want to be in this business like if, if this is the way that the management is going where instead of actually just fixing the problems it's easier to just wallpaper over them like i don't even want to be involved with people that do business. The same thing I brought up a bunch of times on the podcast with like, I didn't want to move operations to Belarus or wherever the, you know what I mean? With the developers that were working on the compounds or the, like yeah. their family was in the next room or whatever. Right. And they had to, like if they, they got fired, their family got kicked out of the compound. And I was like, I don't want to be in business with these people. So I took a career hit because my manager was like, well, you just don't want to play ball. You just don't want to, you know, this is what it takes to, to extend the company and to make us more productive. W- with the cost of people here in the U.S., you can get two people over there, 1.75 people over there or whatever. And if you don't want to deal with outsourcing, then you're just not going to you're not going to move up. It's, you don't you don't understand. It's basic business finance. I was like, it's not business finance. These people are basically being held hostage, man. Yeah. Oh, well, you're you're just being dramatic. I'm like, I don't feel I'm being dramatic. Like, you, if you can't make me feel good as a business partner mm-hmm. about our business arrangement, I don't feel like I'm being dramatic. I feel I'm just following the data. But yeah, in that in that instance, I, I like I'm like I tell people all the time. I'm like, I'm willing to lose arguments. And uh, like, mm-hmm. <laughs> no, and that's fair enough. And but you know what? That's an important thing to keep in mind about personal agility is there are certain things that you there are, certain, there are some absolutes that you should stick to. Yeah. You have to, it's up to the individual to decide what's right for them. I mean, I definitely try to participate in the menace economy where <laughs> I'm, I'm trying not to, I, I want to make fair, I want to earn fair profit for my effort, but I don't want to do it by stepping on somebody's yeah, neck. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a good way to put it. Yeah, absolutely. There, there are alternate ways to, Make sure that you you looked after yourself, right? You've got mm. you, you can pay your bills, etc. Without, as you say, quite quite appropriately stepping on someone's neck. You don't have to do that. Yeah, yeah. A lot of places that I go into, though, it, uh, like it's the culture has been established, especially larger companies that I'll come into. When I was on con, not now, not as much because I I will vet the company and then I'm employed by them. But when I was on contract. I would come into places and have to deal with uh, cultures like yeah. that. I don't even know. I've researched into this to see if it's actually real, if it was a real experiment. And there was there were similar experiments like it, but the, it's uh, monkeys and bananas and ladders. Ah, have yes. you heard about this one? Okay. Yes. Okay, so Ohm is looking at me. I have uh, not. Okay, think. yeah, yeah. So the experiment, supposed experiment, supposed, because I've, again, I've, I've dug into this. I found an experiment that was similar, but not exactly the same thing from the 60s. I think they conducted in the 60s. Basically, the the urban myth at this point Mm -hmm. was they put a bunch of monkeys in a cage, rhesus monkeys, in a cage, and they put a ladder and they put bananas at the top of the ladder. And when a monkey tried to climb the ladder to get the bananas, they would shoot water 
at every monkey in the cage and basically punish them. But not the one that's climbing? Or? I think I think it was everyone. Everyone. Not, everyone. It was a group punishment. Yeah, it was okay. group punishment. Everybody. So assume... Fire hose. Assume... I, again, yeah. I don't know anything about what I'm talking about. So, Because uh, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I couldn't... Fi- I, was, I tried to find the documentation for the actual experiment, but I couldn't. Uh, mm. So I don't know if it, it exactly existed in the form of the way it's being told. Yeah. Anyway, the, the point of the story was, over time, when a monkey would try to climb the ladder the other monkeys would pull the monkey down from the ladder and either beat him up or they would make angry faces, threatening faces that that was actually in the experiment that I did find. It was with the threatening faces at the monkey that actually tried to do the behavior that would get them all hosed down. It's probably not a great <laughs> on the audio, like hose down probably didn't come through very well. That would, that would all get them shot out with a hose. I don't know if that's any better over time. What they would do is they would take, one of the monkeys out and replace him with a new monkey who knew nothing about the behavior. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when the new monkey would go, the all the rest of the monkeys. So basically, the idea was you could replace all the monkeys over time with completely new monkeys, and none of them ever got the banana. They just learned the behavior of yeah. if you climb the ladder, we'll get punished. So don't climb pull somebody down yeah, to climb yeah, the ladder. Yeah, monkey see, so, monkey do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like <laughs> I bring that up. I know it's a really far stretch. I bring that up in the context of personal agility because. I think about a lot of organizations I come into for the first time and I'm like, why do we have these bad learned behaviors of, of like some of the stuff that was in my original list, especially as a product person, I'm not going to say I hate that's too strong of a word, but it, it does irk me when I come on to teams of developers and I hear like, I'm waiting on the next work item. Like I'm waiting on something to do. I'm like, Dude, you solve problems all day. You don't know what problems you need to solve? Like, you need me to... I mean, I'll lead you in a direction because I have goals that are based on the goal of the product or whatever. I am just trying to funnel the business problems right. into a funnel. Like that. I, I mean, I, uh, I'm i not trying to solve them all day. You're basically solving all uh, problems all day. So I, I, when I hear that, I'm like, I, it alerts me in my mind. I'm like, there's an organizational issue with this whole monkey thing. Like, the, the, uh, or, or this person has been beaten down at other organizations to the point where they don't go off and try to stick their neck out anymore. Oh, yeah. No, you know? that's, uh, yeah, basically because they've been victimized by Silence of the Lambs style management. Yeah. It, yeah. Writes, it writes the JIRA ticket on its skin or else it gets the hose I again. Can't, yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I'm sh- the other thing I swear, and then I'll stop with this, is I was at uh, the contract I mentioned earlier. I was at a, a site where I was their first product hire. Mm-hmm. And, and I remember distinctly telling in a meeting with the C-level executives, because I was, it was, it, the reason it made such a big impact on me is because it was one of the first contracts I was on where I felt as an organizational change agent, I was properly placed in the organization to make a difference Mm. because I was placed with the C-suite. All right. So when I stepped in, I was like, you will know. They're like, but Brian, how I like, when are you going to get our teams up to speed? When are you going to transform? Whatever. I was like, it's a slow process. I can't give you milestones because every organization is different. Yeah. I was like, but you will know we're making progress when your backlog starts becoming a mesh of both organizational roadmap goals Mm -hmm. and suggestions from your team members. I was like, because your team members are living in the code every day. Yeah. They know what works and what doesn't work. They know what needs to be refactored. They know what's barely hanging on. And if it breaks, your whole business is going to go to going to go down. Right. Like, Oh, I was like, when your backlog is a mix of those two and we're constantly having discussions Mm -hmm. of like, we need to do this to get ahead we want to achieve this objective here's a way we, maybe we can mix a two maybe we got to do a little of column a a little column b that kind of stuff when those conversations are flowing freely you will know we've broken through to the next level yes and that's a magic moment i, I don't know why i brought that up the point was for me seeing it happen like it was worth celebrating at the time you occasionally need to stop and be like hey like we made a breakthrough today yeah that was good Exactly. And uh, yeah, that that's the thing is that part of this new way, new way of working is figuring out how these lines of communication and direction and authority flow. And uh, the office, I mean, 
encapsulated in its own structure, like the way there are corner offices and the way there's the bullpen with... Yeah, yeah. It, it actually physically showed the, those ways of communication. And we've the, the remote work phenomenon has broken that up. And we just don't have that kind of history. Yeah. Whereas it, working, working locally in place at the office or right on, on site working, we've got 10,000 years of experience of that from with the culture from from the egyptian foreman whipping those guys going those pyramids aren't going to build themselves to <laughs> but at the c-suite with their corner offices we've had these physical structures we're now in brave new world territory here it's something we have to figure out i'm sure people in the history books are going to have a great laugh at our expense as we as we stumble in the dark but at the same time you know what this is the adventure and personal agility, I think of as a commitment to going on that adventure and making and making the best choices we can, knowing what we know at the time. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and yeah, I concur. I, I think that the young generation who is about to enter the workforce in the next maybe two, three years, what they have waiting for them in terms of work culture, they are really going to have to be the most malleable, pliable, <laughs> gone Flexible. are the days, right? When, yeah. when people can say, hey, I'm going to come out of college with a degree, I'm going to get a job. Mm -hmm. it, back in the 60s, I guess people would say, well, I'll retire there with my golden watch. That stopped a long time ago. E even before the pandemic, we were at a point where most professionals in the technology field would flip jobs every two to three years. Yeah, Maybe that goes in tandem with the change in technology, I don't know. But I think going forward another two to three years, what do you think lies in store for those guys? Are they going to go into a job thinking this is work for us? Is it, are they going to work for a company? Are they going to work for four companies at a time? I, mm -hmm. I have no idea. But I think what is important is for them, they're going to have to have this mindset of being very open, very, very much personally agile to, yeah. to this topic, right? Mm -hmm. And indeed not have... I guess not have the security blanket of having employment for extended periods of time. They may just work for a bit and even willingly say, that's enough, right? Yeah. I'm going to take time out now for six months. I don't know. And what we're going to have to figure out as either an industry or maybe even a society is what structures do we have to build to support that new style of work? Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, we definitely don't have those structures right now. Like, we're... Yeah. We don't. My mind yeah. immediately went to those places where you have to write on an application form whether you're employed and how long you've been employed. And they, they judge your eligibility to, to grant you whatever it is based on that. I think all of those beliefs will have to be challenged going forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I have a great... Like, the predictions of the future. I would like to think that things are going to continue on the track that they are i just don't know about a division between like there's a clear division between white collar and blue collar workers yes. in in what we're talking about like i could like, again going back to the very start of the podcast i even think in the work that i do in product management like that like a majority of the time it's just answering questions for the developers and clarifying things and kind of prioritizing things when they need to when discoveries are made during the sprint like while while the sprint is active and uh, i'd be like if i worked at a company like look when it comes to sprint planning time or maybe it's maybe it's back to strategy planning a strategy like higher level type of stuff i'd be okay coming in the office because i think that stuff just goes much 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 faster when you're in person but uh, i still wouldn't advocate to be like i need to be in the office every day i could i, I would struggle to find why I need to be in the office every day. Yes. You know, but it's it. Even, even me saying that, I know that is industry specific though. Mm -hmm. For a good, good range of the tech industry that I've been in for most of my career, I can't, I can't see being in the office every day. Especially the, and I, when I take it to the level of the, the, of the developers I work with, I definitely can't see them being required in the office every day. But the majority of their day is working focused on the code they're writing. Mm -hmm. and I can't see a reason to be like, no, you must be sitting in this chair. 
I think as long as you have com communication channels, electronics, people can speak with one another, communicate with one another, jump on a screen share, whatever it is. Yeah. As long as you have those alternatives, then certain certain lines of work like development might be mm -hmm. one of them software development you don't have to be face to face uh, unless you're celebrating uh, but you I also mean, don't have to be in the office you could be somewhere else yeah i mean i'm going to say something but i'm immediately going to contradict it okay because <laughs> what i'm going to say is i could see if you were doing a uh, pair programming for example for example and you had somebody behind you kind of watching over your shoulder or whatever while you're plugging away i could see that but also like you can do that remote too. Sure. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if it makes a difference. The discipline to be like, hey, I'm going to start coding this. Can you join me? And the discipline to put people together and do that. Honestly, the, the organizational discipline to be a shop like that has been more of a hurdle than actually the technology or someone, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. yeah uh, like, it's always a people thing, but at the same time, there are people who have mass, who have mass, and I've witnessed them, people who have mastered killing time in an office, in a cubicle, no right, problem. Right, they're the ones, right, yeah. uh, let's see, they're the ones who make the really great animals out of push pins and erasers. Mm -hmm. You can tell them, <laughs> <laughs> you can tell by their cubicle really immediately. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I think some of these, uh, some of these leaders that are insisting that people be in the office the whole time. I don't know if what, what's really driving that. Because what I see is that people do go into the office, they sit in little cubicles, just, you know, scattered mm -hmm. around the building, and they're on Zoom calls with one another. Yeah. Well, that makes zero sense, no, right? No, it makes zero sense. Could be, could be long-term leases. Like, all of a sudden, right. you know, they sign, if you signed a 10-year a lease in 2018, you are probably really angry right now. Mm -hmm. like, I honestly, like, it sounds ridiculous, but out of everybody's reason... That makes the most sense to me. Is that some CFO or whatever who has who has yeah. organizational authority? He'd be like, "Look, we just built a new building. Yeah, like, there's no reason. Like, I'm going to send everybody home, and like, there's no occupancy in the building. So, but the, the, but at that point, they're just like it's it's like using velocity. At that point, to me, it's <laughs> like you're just fooling yourself with yeah. numbers that don't matter to anyone. You're saying like I have X percentage occupancy against the amount that I'm paying for the building and yeah. utilities over time means that like, yeah. wh wh who came up with those numbers? What do those matter to the business? That's not any kind of number of effectiveness no. of your business. No, That's you're measuring overhead and trying to say that my effectiveness is somehow. And you're just trying to justify a decision at that point. I yeah. think, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. It just feels heavier because there's money involved. Right. It, it's it, versus velocity or what was the old yeah. metric of lines of code. Yeah. Right. yeah. When I was a consultant, the thing they would want you to deal with is uh, the majority of your time needs to be spent billable yes. so that you can bill to the customer. Mm -hmm. and, but then the consultancy would expect like, well, you need to spend at least a couple of hours d doing administrative stuff for us. And then you need to spend at least a couple of hours doing community building or whatever. And I was like, so wait a minute, you want 100 percent of my hours billable. Yeah. But then you want me to also spend at least whatever, five hours a week or whatever doing this. this so so you want me to spend 110 percent 125 percent of my hours like what are you saying here oh no 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 yeah. no we're not saying you got to work extra we're just saying keep an eye on it but all the all the metrics and everything were dependent on you spending 100 percent of your time yeah billing so although they weren't saying it yeah all of their structure was set up to encourage you to to, to spend 125 percent of your time <laughs> right yeah. right so. Yeah, the way like I don't, we're not gonna be able to get into the incentive structures of organizations and how they're built. All that stuff goes, all that stuff goes back to Taylorism, because he he invented that. He was like, look, if you're gonna, if you're going to pay people three times more or whatever, one point eight, whatever yeah. it was, times more, yeah. uh, up to three times more for producing X times the labor, ten times the labor, whatever it is, you know what I mean? Because we've changed our business practices. If you're gonna get more productivity out of people you need to pay them on some kind of equal scale. Maybe not exactly equal, but mm -hmm. some kind of graded scale. And then companies after that were like, that's a great suggestion, guy. How about we not pay them? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Like what's like 10, I almost want to go more than 10 years in the future. I was like, what is, what is, what's going to happen in 10 years? Everyone's going to be back to the office. Like what's going to happen in 10 years? What's going to happen in 20 years? 
Yeah, that's too far. We're, we're agilists. We yeah. don't know what's happening right? yeah, in 20 years. <laughs> Once we, let's figure out what's happening in three, four years. And then we'll, fi- we'll maybe project out a little bit to 10 years. Then 20 is like, too far. If I'm dreaming, I want to dream big. Sure. I want to be like, dream. what happens? Like, are, are all these people gone in 20 years? Is it, Does this generation age out and be like, oh, we're not, we don't really care where you work from anymore? You know, I mean, unless uh, like, again, unless there's a reason for you to do physical work. I think natural selection will take care of those people or those companies that are doing this. Right. Saying, I, well, no, you I all must come back to the office now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that those people will wither away in the next few years for sure, because people will leave them in droves. It's already happening now. I would hope. I would hope. I, I, I think there's going to be some kind of equilibrium. I think there will. Uh, I, I think there will be some people who may not be able to work outside, uh, whose temperament just kind of says, you know what, I, I work better in, I work better in an office environment. I think the other thing is we just have so much, we have so much cultural force yeah. right. behind the way office work is done. Yeah. Like, I mean, uh, Christmas, Christmas Carol, Ebenezer Scrooge, really? I mean, that was an accounting office. It, if you if you threw a computer in there, it would actually kind of be. Yeah. It wouldn't be all that different from right. today. And we're now talking a couple of centuries of things that have been calcified into the culture. It's uh, These things, these legacies last. Yeah, they do. Yeah. They do. I- I'm expecting a sitcom called The Home Office uh, <laughs> rather than The Office. In- inertia. <laughs> inertia. Would Iner- be the word. Uh, yeah. yeah, inertia and things mm-hmm. like that. Like, I, I mean... I mean the way we write uh, the way we write laws. I mean that's that's Hammurabi, and how long ago was that? We're, we're, yeah, yeah. Like that that's millennia now. Right. So I these mean, things like, these things have force. Do all these people have to go out of business for a change to happen? Like this, you know, what I mean that that's that's kind of where I'm going with this. Like, I, I, I think they're running against the tide if they don't change. Like I, they'll change. Uh, yeah, they'll they'll like I change is one thing. But really understanding and accepting it, like, again, to go back to uh, Ebenezer Scrooge, like, <laughs> he can just be like, oh, the ghost of Christmas past told me to change, so I'm going to make the slightest change on paper, and I'll change the company vision statement, but I'll still keep whipping my employees. There's one, there's one side of it, but the other side of it is I really do decide to refocus my business to say, you know what, like, planning should be done in person, but mm-hmm. once the planning is over... Like planning for me, for example, what I'm talking about. Planning for me is about a half a day's worth of activities once every two weeks. Mm -hmm. That's planning for me. So what I'm talking about is if I'm going to go back to a hybrid hybrid model, uh, Mm -hmm. I'd be like, okay, cool. My hybrid model is once every two weeks, you're you're required to be in the office half a day. We'll cater lunch. The half a day will be, what, 10 in the morning until 2 p.m. or whatever. Or right. probably not even 2 p.m. But probably like 9 in the morning till I don't know, 1.30 or whatever. Because here in where we live, people got to get their kids or whatever. So, yeah. you know what I mean? So, so it'd be worked around that schedule, basically, when school's in session. But it'd be something like that. To be like, well, we're, we're planning on these days. So we're going to revolve our schedule around that. And then if the team wants, they can schedule more time in the office. And otherwise, like, I don't really care where you are. Yeah. You know? I think that'll happen, and I think it's going to follow the early adopter, late adopter curve. Some people hop on Probably, early, some yeah. people hop on late. But, you know, and maybe a lot of things are going to have the same form. Just to use my old pyramids example again, I mean, we still build pyramid-shaped buildings today. But, you know, there isn't there isn't a person in charge with a whip. People are paid. As a, <laughs> they're using modern equipment, and they're in unions versus being slaves. Oh, man. Home knows I can I can go down to, I can go down <laughs> to pyramid go down I can go down to pyramid uh, conspiracy theory rabbit hole because no look at the the cool thing about pyramids wow I guess we're done <laughs> <laughs> well this is a fun podcast I don't uh, I don't know where we started or ended but it was fun for me I don't know. Uh, fun was, for me as well absolutely it was fun, fun for everyone else thank you for uh, for participating today thank and you for having me fantastic. Yeah, this is cool. I also I enjoyed creating a agenda on the fly. I enjoyed that. That was this is, this is our forte. This uh, is what we do. Somehow that's different from our normal podcast. I don't know. It's, it's, <laughs> Not at all. But no. okay. <laughs> well, thank you for the two listeners and viewers that stayed with us all the way up till now. Let us know what you'd like us to delve into next. And don't forget to subscribe below.